black bear movements in response to wildfire in eastern Tennessee. And just to give a little background on wildfires and uh, bears, how they respond to them, in particular black bears, the data is extremely limited. So delving into the lit literature and seeing what I could find, I found these two studies. And this first one, effects of wildfire on black bear demographics in central Arizona, they actually, it was from 1997 to the year 2000, and they had a burned region and an unburned region. And they examined how home ranges uh, shifted or if they would shift in size when compared between regions. And what they found was that female home ranges were very similar in burned versus unburned areas. Now this, there was an exception in the year 2000 in the burned area, the females actually greatly increased their home ranges during that last year of the analysis. Um, they went from around 18 square kilometers up to around 125, so it's pretty significant uh, change, so I, I do need to mention that. Um, the male home ranges were larger in burned areas versus the unburned areas, and uh, like, any, like a lot of other bear studies, male home ranges were larger than females in general overall. Another significant finding in their study, and this is Cunningham and Ballard, was that cub recruitment to the yearling class was 0%. So out of 16 cubs produced in the burn zone by females, 0% of them survived to that yearling class, which is one year of age, in the burned area versus 34 and around 34.5% in the unburned area. And then another study, uh, reactions of grizzly bears um, to wildfire in Yellowstone National Park took place after around after 19, 1988 there was a huge wildfire in Yellowstone and so Blanchard Knight in 1990 did an analysis of that and what they found were they collared grizzly bears six months post the fire and they, they found uh, mainly that the males most most males were moving into the burned areas immediately after the fire following that six month period and looking at SCAT, doing analysis of SCAT, they found that these, what they were doing, these male grizzlies were consuming ungulate carcasses. So outside of these two, stu these two studies, it's limited. I mean, there's hardly anything on like what uh, we put together. For Bill mentioned that I have a project as a graduate student and that Jessica also has a project. And they are both, everyone here I'm sure is familiar with this study site, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. There's a collar and a bear. And so for my specific project, I'm looking at the survi overall survival of black bears rehabilitated and released from Appalachian Bear Rescue. And then secondarily, I'm looking at their, the spatial ecology of those bears. You know, their movements, their home range sizes, um, dispersal, et cetera. And to date, we have at Appalachian Bear Rescue collared and released 31 bears into the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, we have collared and released other bears to other regions, uh, North and South Cherokee National Forest, but the majority of our bears have been uh, released into the Smokies. And with my GPS collars that I'm using, they're gonna be taking a fix, um, which is a position, so a latitude and longitude location, every three hours. And then that information will be relayed to me by a satellite to my PC. So when I get up in the morning, I can click a few buttons and it automatically exports all this data sends it to a, a specific file on my PC, I pull it up on Google Earth and I could tell you where all the bears were the previous day. Assuming that those come through, you know, when you're working with satellites, it gets pretty complicated. So Jessica's, so Jessica's study, she has today collared 40 bears and she's looking at, and Bill I think hit on this, um, adult bear, uh, conflict bears around the uh, wildland urban interface of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And her, she's using the exact same GPS colors that, that I'm using for my study. And the, the difference is that her fix rate is set up every two hours. So she's gonna receive a location every two hours when bears are within the national park boundary. So you can set it up in, um, inside these collars, the data, a setting where if they exit that perimeter, a fix will be taken every 20 minutes. So that's how hers are set up. So with that, everyone, I'm sure, familiar with the Sevier County Chimney Tops 2 wildfire um, recently has recently taken place. And as many of you probably already know, this fire was discovered originally on the 23rd of November. And then by the 27th, approximately 40 acres had burned. And then between the 28th and 29th, uh, multiple fires 
not just the ones that um, were sparked as a result of the Chimney Tops 2 fire, but throughout Sevier County, unrelated to the Chimney Tops 2 fire, uh, had burned an area of 17,000 acres, which is just a whole lot. And then over 175 injuries and 14 fatalities, unfortunately, associated with this event. And over 2,400 structures damaged and destroyed, obviously millions of dollars worth of damage. So with that, as Bill said, it just so happened that we had bears that were collared in this area. You see here, we call it the fire um, perimeter. And this is uh, chimney tops around this area. And this includes the cobbling knob um, area, fire, all of it. And we, um, we had, I had three bears in the fire zone and Jessica had five, five total fires. For the methods, how we uh, determined we want to analyze this data that we had received, we were really hoping on on another piece of data that um, we just we, we couldn't get our hands on. It, did, it didn't we didn't have it, but we chose to use a before and after control impact design or backing design framework to do the statistics. And specifically, what we were looking for um, among three <coughs> different response variables, and that includes kernel utilization distribution, so home range sizes or in this case, we're calling them areas of activity because they're only three day periods. It wasn't exactly um, like what a home range would be um, frame was. We also looked at movement rates. So mean movement rates and mean direction of travel. Those are the three response variables that we wanted to analyze. And we were using the factors um, at time by treatment interaction effect, specifically is what we were really interested in. And for our three day period, so the time variable before, during and after, each being three days long. That's how we divided those up. And then origin, we use origin and sex as uh, blocking factors in this, in this analysis. And the origin was either bears rehabilitated and released from Appalachian Bear Rescue or bears that were already part of uh, adult bears, part of Jessica's study. Mm -hmm. And this actually, and it, it, it helped, it kind of subdivided our study by age two. So all of the bears released from ABR are gonna be sub adults or younger, whereas all the Jessica's bears are going to be adults. So origin can kind of be viewed as an age class as well. And then obviously sex, male versus female. And now Jessica will take it over and tell you about some of the results. Thank you, Hi. So the next thing, I'm going to shift into the results section and talk about I'm going to have some maps up here that we're going to look at, and these are the before, during, and after visuals of what these bears did. Um, so for this first one, just to kind of orient yourself towards this map. So this red is, again, the burn area. Um, these yellow dots, each individual dot is on a GPS fix that was picked up by this particular bear. So this one was 953. It was um, one of the bears that was rehabilitated at ABR and then released, um, and it was a young male. Um, another thing to note really quick, this was the before diagram, and remember the fire obviously hadn't occurred yet, so pretend that polygon's not there yet. Um, so this is the before, during, and after. Can you guys see that okay, or do you want the lights down? I will turn the lights down. Okay. okay. So again, this was a young male. This was um, GRSM 955, so we give all of our bears a number. Uh, to identify them. So this guy, you can see him, he's kind of over in this area. Before, this is during, skip him ahead. Okay. Before, during, and after. You can see that area is pretty tiny. Um, this is another young male, before, during, and after. And this male was hanging out over by Chimney Tops, which is where um, that fire kind of originated from. And now we're gonna switch over to some of my adult bears. And things to look at are just area used. Um, it's a little bit different. So an adult female. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, again, chimney tops area before, during, and after the fire. This was an adult male, 637. So you can see he was actually outside of the park. Um, he's out a little bit east of Gatlinburg before, during, and after. What he's kind of interesting is after you see he made these wide movements back into the park. This is another adult female, before, during, and after the fire. This was an adult male, you can see he's kind of 
outside of the park as well, before, during, and after. And then one more adult female before, during, and after. And you can see how she moved pretty quickly, and there's only two points for it after the fire because she went to the den shortly after. Usually when they go into the den, we lose GPS signal on them because they'll go into a tree or if they go underneath the ground, the satellites can't communicate with the caller. So our results, I don't know why I'm having <coughs> issues with the clicker again. It did it to me too a little bit. Okay, bear with me. Um, one thing I do want to note is that Coy mentioned that we only had eight bears that were in the fire, and these were bears that were active. So this is the time of year when a lot of females are going into dens. Bears that were already in dens um, in the burn area, we didn't use for analysis. Obviously, you can't calculate a movement rate or really a home range size um, for those individuals if they're not moving. So we didn't include those. There were more than eight bears in the fire zone. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, of the 11 bears using the burned area, that we included, um, we had no mortalities. And I think that's really interesting to know. Um, so we had these bears with GPS collars and none of my bears or Koi's bears um, with collars ended up dying due to the fire. Um, the total number of active bears, so these were bears that weren't denning yet, was 20. Um, 17 males and three females that were used in this study. One thing to note, three females um, is a pretty small number compared to the males, and that's general because females go to dens way earlier than the males. Um, I know in 2015, when we looked at my data, we had females going into dens around mid-November, um, and our males usually wait until more around Christmas time. So in our study for the 20 total bears, we had eight fire bears, so three um, came from ABR, they're the rehabilitated bears, and five conflict bears, they were the ones that were the adults that were part of my study. Uh, and then for control bears, we had 12 that we used, so these are bears that weren't using um, the fire zone. So we wanted to compare their movements to the bears that are actually in the burn zone. So we had eight bears from ABR, and then four of my adult um, males. And what we found, which was kind of interesting, was there's no significant difference between the way bears moved in the fire perimeter versus bears that were outside of that burn zone. And that was the big question. Um, I know Coy got it a lot, I got it a lot. I'm sure Bill and the park staff did, was how were bears affected by the fire? You know, Did they leave the area? And what we found was they really, in terms of home range size, their sizes didn't really shift. Um, movement rates, they didn't really differ. Um, and then the direction of travel didn't vary as well. We did find that origin and sex did impact movement rates. So remember we looked at home range size, movement rates, and direction of travel. But origin and sex only impacted movement rates. And this has been kind of demonstrated in other studies, um, Marcellus and Pelton, and actually Bill's work um, in 91, where um, a lot of other studies have demonstrated that origin, so in our case we were looking at, were they from ABR or NPS, which we also talked about, divides them up into are they sub-adults or adults. So our adult bears moved, uh, their movement rates were larger than the sub-adult bears. And then sex, so male and females, and that's another thing a lot of other studies have demonstrated that males tend to cover more ground than females, especially during the fall. So what we found overall, fire did not significantly impact movement rates, direction travel, or the area used, mm -hmm. like I said. Fire was not the factor, it was um, sex and origin. Why? Some things we were thinking about, winter denning. Like I said, a lot of our females had already started going into dens. Um, hyperphagia, so during the fall, bears usually tend to slow down. Their home range sizes usually shrink because they're feeding really heavily. Um, part of the area that was burned, there were quite a few acorns, and we noticed that there's a large concentration of bears there. They don't have to cover as much ground. They're eating those acorns. Um, and that may have played a role as well. Sample size and data quality. One thing you can note, we only had eight bears that we used um, for our fire analysis bears. And maybe if we had a larger sample size, we would have seen something different. That's something to keep in mind. Um, and then data quality. Like Coy had mentioned, we were kind of expecting um, more of a time series with the fire, and we didn't have that data available. Um, so maybe if we had different data, but again, it was such a, Short term, it happened really suddenly. It's not getting ones out collecting that data. And then again, like I said, it was a short term fire, so maybe we would have seen different 
uh, a re different response by bears if the fire had lasted longer. And another thing we just want to know is bears are very adaptable and they're resilient. Like with our conflict study, this was taken right outside of Twin Creeks, which I believe you guys were there earlier. Um, this was a large, I believe he's about 400 pound male. And they do really well in human dominated landscapes. It's something we found with my study. And you know, maybe they just, they handle fire well, they handle changing environments well, um, and they're able to adapt very quickly. We will say that there were two confirmed um, mortalities due to fire. They weren't GPS collared bears, that is one thing to note. So there was one year, I believe it was a yearling, found about a week and a half after the fire, um, and it ended up being taken to UT uh, and treated by the vets there, and his injuries were pretty severe, so he ended up being euthanized. And then we also had this large male, and you can see all his hair has been pretty much scorched off. And it's interesting, this male, 600 pounds, when they found him shortly after the fire, um, they caught him during the summer, when they're a little bit lighter, he's 375 pounds. So during the fall, he put on over 200 pounds, which is really impressive. Another thing to note is, like I said, winter denning. So right now, Koi and I are spending the next, well, we've spent the past couple months looking for winter dens. And we do that to check their GPS collars, to make sure they fit okay, and just to make, um, with our females, we check if they have cubs and things like that. And we've noticed that quite a few of our bears have actually denned in these heavily burned areas. So, I don't know why it's like skipping ahead. Um, so this is one bear that Koi um, had up really close to chimney tops, actually. And he's in this tree den. There's Koi there. You can see him looking at that tree. Um, that area burned pretty heavily. This was another um, young male that Koi had collared that was in a ground den, also near chimney tops. And then, I know this isn't the best quality image, but this was actually in a very, very heavily burned area near Minot Park, um, which you guys passed on your way to Twin Creeks. And this female, I mean, there's essentially nothing left um, in terms of green vegetation. Even the rhododendron leaves are all completely gone. And um, her den was actually, she just curled up in a ball, I guess, and kind of excavated a little hole and was just laying there. So that does say something. These bears are still using those areas. So in summary, again, none of our GPS um, bears uh, experienced mortality from this, and we didn't see any movement anomalies due to the fire. Long-term effects, so the fire, there's a lot of ash, and that can affect um, the vegetation in the future, and that might be something we could look at. Koi and I are going to continue our projects for the next year or so, so with these bears still collar, there is that opportunity to continue monitoring them and seeing if they use these areas, and um, maybe we can look a little bit at vegetation changes in those spaces. Here are some of the references we mentioned, and these are all the people we just want to acknowledge. Um, USGS played a big role in this TWRA, obviously the Park Service, uh, Friends of the Smokies APR. And with that, are there any questions? <laughs> I don't know why.